So we've been in this series called Arrival. We're talking about some of the things that come with Jesus' arrival around Christmas time. And we've been using John chapter 1 as a launching point. So if you have your Bible, open up to John chapter 1. All right, John chapter 1. Uh, and we were in, over the last couple of weeks, we've been in the first five verses of John 1, and today we're going to move to a different section of this poem in John 1. It's going to start in John 1, verse 9, and so you can uh, grab your Bible, follow along there, John 1, verse 9. It says, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. You know, today, as we turn our attention to this section of John's poem, uh, it's, a, it's a really uh, interesting uh, kind of shift uh, because we're moving from kind of talking about light and life uh, to talking about um, God's glory, essentially, um, and the glory of God. So the word glory, if you don't know, is the word weight. That's, that's just how you would translate it. We don't use it very often outside of church, right? I mean, we don't walk around going, hey, may I get a measure of your glory? Um, you know, but uh, so, so like, uh, can you step on the scale so I can see what, how glorious you are? Um, you know, we don't, we don't do that uh, because that might be inappropriate, depending on who you're talking to. Um, but that's what it means. It means weight. It means uh, how much does something weigh. It means what makes up something. What, what is something made up of? What does something consist of? Another way of saying this, especially in regards to Jesus, is that in Christ we see the arrival of the fullness, of the completeness of God. Paul actually says these exact words in Colossians chapter 1. He says that for in him talking about Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. All of who God is, was, and forever will be, is found in Christ. That is the glory of God. Now, there is something beautiful, I think, when it comes to these verses, these verses in John and correlating them with the verses in uh, Colossians. I love the idea because it's, it's this idea, this beautiful thing um, where the fullness of God is making its dwelling, its tabernacling in Jesus, it's setting up its tent in Jesus, and Jesus sets up his tent with us. He dwells with us. He tabernacles with us. It's a really, really interesting way to, to continue to come back to this idea of the fullness of the God in heaven is coming to earth to be with the fullness and in the fullness of his image bearers on earth in Christ. It is a uniting work of heaven and earth. It's a really, really beautiful, beautiful picture. But John says that because the word becomes flesh, we've actually seen it. He's an eyewitness, so that's what he's, he's proclaiming, his eyewitness testimony. We've actually seen it. We've seen the glory of God, the fullness of God in Christ. That's a really powerful image. You know, others in the scriptures have seen the glory of God. Uh, many stories in the Old Testament talk about this or point to this idea. And oftentimes there is an experience and something that takes place when someone experiences the glory of God. Something significant happens, right? Uh, Moses experiences the glory of God in the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, and it says that he hid his face from God. He begins to walk with God as one who walks with a friend uh, as he leads God's people through the wilderness, and he, and he continues to put a veil over his face whenever he will go to meet with God because the glory of God is too much for him. You see this idea of Joshua when he comes into contact in, in the book of Joshua with the uh, general or the commander of the Lord's army. He, he bows down in reverence of where he's at and what he's experiencing 
You see that Elijah covers his face with his cloak. You see that Isaiah bows down and confesses, woe is me, a man of unclean lips. When the glory of God comes in the room, it does something to people. People begin to have an awareness and they come in contact with the glory of God. They, they, they bow low, they hide their face, they cover themselves, they realize that the glory of God is too much for them. And they realize that they are not worthy of being in the presence of such a glorious God. They are humbled, they are keenly aware of their weakness and their smallness. And they're keenly aware of his grandeur and power, and majesty, and strength. They become aware of his glory. But did you notice how our passage in John started today? Did you notice the contrasting, very different idea from John 1, verses 10 and 11? It says this. It says, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. That's a wildly different response to the glory of God, isn't it? Other translation says that he was not recognized. People did not recognize him as the glory of God. Jesus was and is the fullness of the glory of God. It's what John tells us. It's what Paul tells us. It's what we find all throughout as we see him heal and love and care and offer compassion and forgiveness and healing and conquer the grave. And, oh, man, it's just like we can't help but see it, but people missed it. So many people missed it. And it really begs the question, have we missed it? It begs the question, when was the last time that we stopped and took a look around and took in the glory of God? You know, we live in a world that's marked by the rising sun and its setting that rises at the command of God. It gets its directions from him. <laughs> when was the last time we stopped to ponder that? When was the last time we woke up like this morning with breath in our lungs? And we sit here right now and our chests move up and down at the rhythm of the spirit of God within us. Because the Ruach Elohim, the spirit of God, breathed into the dirt and brought humanity into existence. And so all of our days and all of our life and all of our existence is propelled forward by the Spirit of God within us. When was the last time we stopped to ponder that? You know, we live in a world with so many beautiful faces, Brown faces and white faces and tan faces and black faces all revealing this beautiful image of our creator. When was the last time we stopped to ponder that? When was the last time we stopped and saw our brother and our sister in the stranger? When was the last time that we saw someone who looked different than us and our first thought was their beauty and not their strangeness? Maybe, maybe we should just say that, that when was the last time that we saw the immensely powerful, amazing, beautiful glory of God and it actually humbled us? It brought us to our knees. When was the last time it touched our hearts? When was the last time it left us speechless? Most all of us, when we look at the cross, should see nothing but the glory of God. 
But when was the last time we looked upon the cross? The broken body and the shed blood. When was the last time we took the bread and took the cup in our hands? Remembering God's loving promise. And we couldn't help but know our weakness and we couldn't help but know his power. And it overcomes our weakness. When was the last time we were brought to our knees by, by that idea? When was the last time we were so humbled to know that the glory of God was given to us in Christ, that we might be saved by his love? When was the last time we heard of the empty tomb and we fell down and we worshiped because the glory of God had taken away sin and death? When was the last time the Spirit of God, we saw it join with someone else's life, and we saw it changing them and transforming them from the inside out, and we said, man, that's the glory of God making them new. When was the last time we paid attention to the, the, the way God's glory is making us new? When was the last time that we were so deeply humbled because of the glory of God? The glory of God that's in you and in me and given to us that we might carry out good works that he's prepared for us beforehand that his kingdom may come here on earth as it is in heaven. When was the last time? Have we missed it? Have we failed to recognize the glory of God that came and made its dwelling with us in Jesus. You know, some of you may wonder, why, why do we sing? Anyone, am I the only one that ever thinks that that's weird? That we like show up here and we just sing? Do you do that anywhere else? Like, I mean, like, just think about this for a second, right? There aren't very many places where people just show up in a room and they just start singing songs. I mean, maybe people who love music or who love a particular band or share some sort of shared experience at some concert, maybe, right? Maybe. But what about us? I mean, we're different people from different backgrounds, different generations, different ethnicities, different denominations, different people who aren't musically gifted, who aren't musically inclined, who aren't musically inspired, who don't even like singing songs, why do we sing? Because of the glory of God. Because the glory of God ushers in each new day. The sun doesn't rise and set at our command. It rises and sets at his. It's because of the glory of God has come near to us in Christ, and we are not saved by our doing, but by his. It's because the glory of God has saved us in Christ and given us new life that we might not have to be who we once were, but we can be something different. It's the glory of God that sustains us. It's his breath in our lungs that we cry out with when we sing. It's the glory of God that unites us. All these different faces. It's because of the glory of God. That's why we sing. And it should humble us. And it should move us. And it should touch us deep within ourselves. Because the reality is we are not worthy to have received these gracious gifts. And yet he's offered them to us anyway. You know, I, I don't know about you, but I, I just, I think we've missed it. I think we've missed it when we can just show up in a room like this and stand 
deadpanned. When we're singing songs to our God. I think we've missed it. When church becomes more about us as the individual and what I like and what I want and my preferences and not about us. I think we've missed it when we make it about how loud the music is or how bright the lights are. I think we've missed it when we think because we're going through a hard time, we still can't praise. See, the reality is, is that like, man, I just, we've gotten so comfortable that the glory of God can be ushered into a room and we will just miss it. I believe we've missed it when we can go to the table and take the bread and take the cup and just say, well, this is just something we do every week. And it not just impact our hearts and our minds in such a deep way because that is our hope and that is our salvation. And this is a meal that Jesus himself instituted and called us to remember together. And we just walk and grab the bread and grab the cup and go back and sit down and it doesn't do anything to us. So here's my prayer. You may be wondering, like, well, you like kind of got the hint that like, oh, we did something different today. <laughs> you know, like, why is Derek preaching before we do anything else? Well, because today is a day that we have an opportunity to not let the glory of God go missed. Today is a day that we have the opportunity to bless the Lord with our souls and with our voices and with our hearts and with our minds. Today is a day where we can let the glory of God soften our hearts because some of us are hard. We're calloused. My prayer today is that today is a day that brings us to our knees in the presence of God. It humbles us to know that, man, we are not worthy. It draws us to this place to repent and turn away from our sin, confess our failures, bring us to live at peace with our neighbors and our friends and our brothers and our sisters. My prayer is that the glory of God may do something in us and change us. It may be all we want to talk about. It may be all we want to share. All we recognize when we look upon that person to our left and to our right and in front of us and behind us, we see the glory of God. We recognize the glory of God in each other. We recognize the glory of God in our salvation We recognize the glory of God when we wake up and the spirit of God is alive and well in us and he's put breath in our lungs. My hope is that we don't take one more day without recognizing the immense, beautiful, amazing, powerful glory of God that we get and that we can take in because of Christ. Because he was willing to come and tabernacle with us. He was willing to come and be with us. Now we can see the glory of God in everything, in all that we are and all that we do. 
And we can give all we are in response. And so my hope is that we sing louder than ever before today. Sometimes you let the message set up the worship. Sometimes you let the worship set up the message. Today we're letting the message set up the worship because we want to lift the roof off of this place today. You may say, well, you know, there's not as many in here as there were last week. It's cold, it's rainy. It's, ra- it's, it's actually a great day for a nap. Well, great. Then <laughs> worship God and give him glory with your nap later today. But right now, while we're here, let's give everything we got, right? Like, let's just give everything we can give. Sing like never before. For the glory of God is here with us right now. Let's not miss it. Let's pray. God, I thank you for... I thank you for today. I thank you for putting breath in our lungs. And I pray that we see and realize and recognize your glory with each breath. I pray that we see and recognize your glory with each new day. With the mercies that are new this morning. God, I pray that we will be so humbled and so brought to our knees by you. God, I pray that we will sing like never before. That we'll shout and praise your holy name. Because there is no name that's higher. There is no name that is greater than the name that is above every name. The name that will draw every knee to bow and every tongue to confess that you are king. That you are Lord. Because you are the only thing. You are the only, only, only one to, to come and live a perfect life and die and deal with our problem called sin. Wiping it away. Washing us white as snow. May we not hold back our praise. May we not hold back our songs or our voices. May we give you all that we have today. May we give you glory and honor. Because you brought glory from heaven to earth. To give us light in life. Hope and healing. So we magnify your name, Jesus. We magnify your name and bow down before you, the maker of heaven and earth. We pray this in Jesus' name. invite you to the table today um, to take the bread and the cup and see the glory of God. The glory of God that overcame our sin, took our sin upon himself and offered this unbelievable gift of grace. May we sit with it and may it humble us and may it draw us to sing and worship with everything we have today. Amen?